What's up you guys? Today we're going to discover together if it's better to have a 100 yard zero or a 200 yard zero or something else for big game hunting. The reason that we're talking about this is because I was listening to two of my favorite podcasts this week. One, Long Range Pursuit from Gunworks, and the other one is uh, Joseph Von Benedict's podcast, the Backcountry Hunting Podcast. So, both experts, and here's what Joseph Von Benedict said. So 200 yards zero, closer is stupid, further is risky. There you go. And then here's what they said on the Gunworks podcast. Recently, we've moved over to exclusively 100 yard zeros, and that's what you're teaching at the Long Range University as well. So reasonable minds can definitely differ here on which one is right. I think most hunters would say the 200 yard zero is best. For me, I've always picked 100 yards, and so I wanna talk about the pros and cons of each so you can pick. I mean, kind of set out a spot here to shoot. Grab the SIG Cross for today. We're out camping, so if I look like I'm kind of a mess, that's why. So the reason that a lot of people pick a 200 yard zero is because of the MPBR, the maximum point blank range. And it really makes sense. The idea is that if you take a six inch PVC pipe and pretend it's 300, 400 yards long, right? If I were to put my gun exactly in the middle there, how far could I go without the bullet touching the top of that pipe or the bottom of that pipe, right? Because they're saying, well, the vitals on a deer are six inches, probably more than that. And so all I need to do is if my bullet stays in there, then I'm good. And so on most rifle cartridges, here are a few numbers just as examples. You're between 270 yards and 320 yards to, for a six inch maximum point blank range. And so they say, well, if I sight in at zero, I'm wasting some of that range. If I sight in at 200, then uh, it, it's more correct to be in the middle of that circle for longer. And so that is one compelling reason to pick the 200 yard zero. So first we're gonna shoot a group at 100 yards, and then we're gonna shoot a group at 200 yards, and hopefully it'll become apparent the big problem with the 200 yard zero. So here's my group at 100 yards, three shots touching, but a little bit low, I need to adjust for that. But now, let's take that same target out to 200, I'm not gonna touch the windage, and let's watch what happens. Let's go look at that target. So here's 100 yards, perfect windage, and just with this little bit of breeze we have going here, now this is actually three shots, three shots, but look, it pushed it off half of an inch. So to me, that's the core problem with the 200 yard zero is, to me, it's kind of rare that I'm shooting and there's like truly zero wind. There's always a little bit of something. And so your zero then is dependent on your ability to judge wind. I kind of did a bad job in the field explaining these next couple points, so I'm gonna bounce to the office for a second. You are much more likely to have elevation error in your zero if you have a 200 yard zero. So, you know, it's hilly, mountainous here in Utah, and so it can be hard to find a perfectly flat spot to zero in, that's 200 yards. And so if you zero in at 200, but we're up a little bit high at the target or you're a little bit higher than the target, it can really mess things up to getting a precise zero. It's also easier to check your zero when you get to your hunting location. Every time I go hunting, I love, if I possibly can, when I get to the location, check my zero again, make sure everything is right. And it's just harder to find a flat 200 yard spot to check your zero when you're hunting. But a really good reason to pick the 200 yard zero is you have more elevation adjustment now in your scope. If you're trying to get out to a thousand yards, you know, not, not for necessarily for hunting, but for a dual purpose rifle, you know, something you take to the range, but also hunt with, it's nice to be able to get out to a thousand yards. And if you have that 200 yard zero, just gives you that much more elevation to work with. Other thing I wanna show you is today's video sponsor, these are sweet. Check this out. Honey, did you take the Kamakoto knives again? You know, the ones that are sourced from Japanese steel mills? 
they have that single beveled edge. It actually takes them several years to make the knives through a 19 step process. I know they're way better than our kitchen knives, but I need them for the video, hun. So these knives are seriously legit. They cut through everything like butter. It's so nice. Each knife is individually inspected. They come with a lifetime guarantee. They come in this nice ashwood box. It's exactly what you want. Kamakoto is running a Labor Day sale right now. They're already priced really well, but you can get an additional $50 off by using coupon code BACKFIRE. And then you'll be slicing through everything, no problem. Peaches, apples, soda cans, Never mind, don't do the soda can. So reasonable minds can differ on the 200 yard zero because if a deer pops up at 220 yards, it's really nice to have that 200 yard zero because it just helps with that maximum point blank range um, that you don't have to make any adjustment. Then again, I don't know how hard it is. Like if you just get used to your scope, if something pops up and you just know, whoop, one MOA, like how long did that take, you know? So that's why, to me, it feels like a pretty small benefit to just be ready at any second. I mean, we're talking about how long does that take, really, you know? If you just know, uh, you know, 1.1 MOA, 1.25, then it's a pretty quick adjustment. But I think the area where, so reasonable minds can differ on the 200 yard or 100 yard zero. I will tell you the one thing that I just really don't like it when hunters do. In my opinion, it's probably not the best uh, route is so many people just say, I just side in at 1.5 inches high and boom, you're set. Well, obviously that doesn't work because every cartridge drops a different amount at 200. And so obviously we're, we're throwing in some just guesses here of where it's going to be. And that's where I don't like it is where hunters really just say, ah, we're just gonna guess. We're gonna be a little bit higher at 100 and then I'm good. And then you set a limit on yourself and you say, okay, but I'm only shooting to 250. But I know if you see that 300 inch deer or that 300 inch elk or that 200 inch deer out at 450 yards, I know you're gonna try and you're not equipped for it because you've just thrown randomness in this. And so I definitely like seeing hunters who are precise. Um, one, one comment I hear a lot on this is people say, uh, the vitals on a deer are so big. You got whatever, eight inches, 12 inches. Everybody tells me a different uh, amount. And so you don't really have to be that precise on everything. But those every time I talk to those guys, they are the ones that end up wounding game. Uh, because you say, oh, my zero is, well, three inches off because I did it at 200 yards and a little bit of wind. And I guessed it wasn't pushing the bullet that much. And whatever, I go this inch and a half high and I don't need a range finder. I don't take the long range shots and everything. And then what happens when you get a, you know, a quartering away angle at that deer and suddenly those 12 inch vitals, you actually have a little narrow window that you got to put that bullet into, right? Uh, or between trees, there are just so many different things. But the people I see who take it seriously and want to make a perfect shot, it's like, I'm not just going for vitals. Where exactly am I going to hit? Am I going to go for a high shoulder? Am I going for the heart shot? You know, the people who can really dial it in, they don't really wound game if you're being that precise and you really know what you're doing. And so that's one reason I don't love the inch and a half high at 200. I'm having trouble with this gun. So I've shot this a lot on the channel. You guys know it is incredibly accurate, the rifle. But I'm having some issues with the scope. I don't know if it's the scope itself or the rings or what. I know I've scoped it properly. Everything's perfectly torqued down and stuff. They're also triple screw rings, pretty beefy ones. And so I've got to think the rings are probably not the problem. But something is happening because like we saw here, well, I've zeroed this rifle and then I'll come back the next time to shoot and it's a tiny, tiny little pattern, but they're a half inch low or half inch high. It just seems to be wandering on me every time I zero it. And so that's something to really watch on your gun, especially if they're bouncing around in a truck while you're going camping. But really, even if not, even if it's really set in the safe, a lot of times that happens to me is we get kind of a wandering zero even if we're shooting tight groups. So I'm a little bit concerned about this scope 
This is the Leupold VX3 HD 4.5 to 14 by 40. I really like this scope. It's a good scope, but I've had maybe 10 different times that I zero this, come back the next time, and we are not on the same zero, even, you know, in kind of same kind of terrain. So I'm interested. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace these rings and just keep everything else the same and see if we keep having that issue. But it's definitely something to be aware of on your rifles is to make sure they're truly zeroed. One other time that that can happen is a lot of times people will spend an hour shooting, getting ready for the season, right? And your bullet, your barrel is never totally cool. For a barrel to completely cool, it may be something like 15 minutes, even if it wasn't that hot. Yeah, a lot of times people get impatient and it's like, eh, it's not that cold, but the difference in temperature can make a big difference on that zero. And so if you're a capable shooter, you can shoot out pretty far, but you have a wandering zero, it's just gonna throw everything off. And so I like to have a, a rifle that I can zero and then go out four or five more times before hunting season and be sure that zero isn't wandering on me every time. So there was a study done a few years ago that they said 11% of big game require a second shot, a finishing shot. And, you know, for the hunting I do, I mean, it's almost never uh, do I have to walk up and put a finishing shot in game. I mean, almost never. But when you just watch, you know, Bob that gets out of his truck and has put 10 shots through his rifle before hunting season, yeah, you're going to end up wounding a lot of game. I would not making the perfect shot to put that animal down as precisely as possible. So for most of us doing rifle hunts, we have a few weeks now, like it's the time we need to be out there and shooting. Find a load your gun likes, get it shooting one him away or less, and then get to know everything about that gun. If you don't have a chronograph to be getting the speed so you can type it into a ballistics app, you know, do the real test, test it at 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. And then one thing I always do, actually we should do a video on this, is one thing I like to do before a hunt is I'll just fill up milk jugs, saying that's eh, about vital size, right? I'll fill up a whole bunch of milk jugs with water and I'll just go stash them, 50 yards, 150 yards, 200 yards, wherever, and then go on real terrain that you might actually shoot, not on a mat with a rear bag and everything, like actual your hunting setup, and go find out what your limit really is. See how many of those jugs you hit the first time on every shot trying different positions. And I think it will humble a lot of us who realize, okay, maybe some skills have gotten rusty over the winter and we got to really train up so that you make that perfect shot on game this fall. You ready to go home, buddy? Stopped even running around. You're giving some long blinks back here.